everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Image-Based Screening for Precision Medicine and Immunotherapy, presented by Dr. Gregory Vladimir, CSO and Scientific Co-Founder, Allsight. I'm Alexis Kraus of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is brought to you by LabRoots and sponsored by Perkin Elmer. Perkin Elmer is a global leader committed to innovating for a healthier world. Their innovative detection, imaging, informatics, and service capabilities, combined with deep market knowledge and expertise, help customers gain earlier and more accurate insights to improve lives and the world around us. For more information about our sponsor, please visit parkinelmer.com. Now, let's get started. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the Support tab found at the top right of the presentation window, or report your problem by clicking on the Answer a Question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I'd like to now introduce our presenter, Dr. Gregory Vladimir. Gregory Vladimir is the CSO and scientific co-founder of Allsight in Vienna, Austria, where high throughput and high contact confocal microscopy of primary patient samples is used in order to define drug action at single cell resolution. Dr. Vladimir received his PhD in immunology from the Program in Innate Immunity of the Department of Medicine at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. Prior to his postdoctoral work at the Center for Molecular Medicine, STEM, of the Austrian Academy of Sciences, Dr. Vladimir and his colleagues performed what they believe was the first prospective study assessing the feasibility and efficacy of ex vivo drug response profiling to guide personalized treatment selection across large panels of possible treatments for patients suffering aggressive hematological malignancies, published at the interim stage last year in Lancet Hematology. The methodology for the screening was invented by a team of scientists who met at SEM, including Professor Dr. Baran Snyder, Dr. Nicholas Kral, and Professor Dr. Giulio Superfiti Ferga. The team is now focused on determining the feasibility of deploying such image-based single cell screening assays into the clinical realm for patients with various malignancies. For the complete biography on our speaker, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Vladimir, you may now begin your presentation. Great, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, so Allsight, uh, as was just mentioned, is a spin-off company of SEM, the Center for Molecular Medicine of the Austrian Academy of Sciences. And today, I'll talk about a number of stories that we've done or performed at SEM in collaboration with the Medical University of Vienna, Department of uh, Hematology and Hemostasiology. So with that, these are my disclosures. I'm a shareholder and employee of Allsight in Vienna. So one of the aims of my work and also Allsight's work is to improve the translatability of preclinical research. We believe that there's a high unmet need for model systems that better recapitulate the complexity of human disease, are more predictive of clinical outcome than currently available cell line and animal models. And further that modeling human immune function has proven particularly challenging. And when looking at technologies like PDX uh, derived uh, patient samples or humanized mouse uh, or humanized animal models, they're limited in throughput and they have long tumor passages that may skew results. So today I'm gonna talk about a technology that we call pharmacoscopy. This is single cell imaging technology platform that can profile drug action directly in primary cancer patient samples with high throughput, with minimum amounts of sample, minimal incubation times to reduce adaptation to ex vivo conditions. And we use this to get a preview of activity, of drug activity or stimulant activity directly in human samples. So this is an overview of my talk today. I'll discuss the technology and applications, and then I'll move on to the interim analysis of a clinical trial called EXALT, where we prioritized interventions for patients with late stage hematological malignancies. And I'll talk a little bit about resulting drug resistance maps, 
the integration of multi-omics data sets into our screening data to rationally identify drug combinations. And then lastly, the investigation of mechanisms of immunomodulatory drugs through measuring the physical interactions of cells. So this is an overview of the pharmacoscopy technology that I'll discuss. Um, samples are taken from patients, either blood or bone marrow samples, homogenized lymph tissue, pure effusion or ascites samples. And then we purify up mononuclear cells. These contain cancer cells and also healthy cells. There's no other cell sorting or outgrowth. It's just a, a FICOL gradient to remove those mononuclear cells. And they're put into plastic 384 well imaging plates, clear plastic bottom and a black surface. These, um, the dogma originally for high content screening was that adherent cell lines must be used to obtain an in imageable monolayer that can be stained uh, looking for pathways or cells of interest or phenotypes of interest. We broke that dogma and are now able to create a monolayer of non-adherent cellular material that we can fix in place and stain with antibodies against cell surface receptors, phosphorylation events, or other things we want to look at. So after they're fixed and stained, we image them and they run through an image analysis pipeline that I'll discuss in a moment. And we can do normal, at the bottom of the uh, plates, you'll see we can do normal um, image analysis, cell, cell size, cell morphology, surface marker expression, signaling events, so again, translocation or protein translocation, and phosphorylation events. But through the image analysis of these particular images uh, of uh, what we call pharmacoscopy, we can also pull out two other scores. On the top right-hand side, you'll see a drug response score. This is the ex vivo measurement of differential killing potential of anti-cancer drugs that I'll show you can correlate to clinical responses in our interim basket trial. And then the second below that is the spatial interaction score. And this is the quantification of immune synapse formation as a novel measure of immunomodulation, so literally measuring cell cell contacts. So I wanna talk about a little bit of the data that we're collecting. Um, we do consider this to be big data. So we perform these assays in 300, uh, 384 well plates. If we assume that we're utilizing a 10X objective, we image each well four times. It's two by two overlapping, um, overlapping matrix. So we gather all the information from the entire bottom of the well. We do this in five color channels, um, and that is really the capacity of our microscope is five color channels or five channels. And so every 90 minutes, we're collecting 7,680 images. If we can run our platform at 24 hours, we have two microscopes that do this. That's 32 plates in, per day. That's 245,000 images per day, which is about 12 terabytes of raw imaging data per month. Now the analysis of these images, again, since we're looking at precision medicine and we're looking at how drugs affect or how we can put data back into the clinic, we need to be quick about this and the analysis. If we analyze a single plate on an eight core workstation, that would take about 45 hours, but we can bring this down to about 30 minutes using an expandable cloud-based system that meets EU healthcare data privacy laws. And more information about that program can be found on our website. Looking at the data points now per cell that we're collecting, if we Consider that we look at, let's say, 10,000 cells per well, we're looking at about 2.1 times 10 of the uh, 10 data points collected per day. And we're also then trying to in integrate those data points that we collect from imaging into the genetics. And again, I'll talk about that. So we do consider this to be fairly big data. So let's get into now what we're doing with these programs. And the first one is the EXALT trial. So prioritizing intervention for patients with late stage hematological malignancies. Now, I have a little bit here on the current take on precision medicine and cancer, and the debate on ex vivo chemosensitivity screening has been going on for some time. I'd like to show this paper from the 1980s in uh, the NEJM, a critical appraisal of the human um, tumor stem cell assay. So these uh, assays have been around for a long time. So if we talk now about a paper that has been published a little bit more recently, looking at precision medicine for cancer with fun next generation functional diagnostics, when we consider ourselves a next generation functional test, we're kind of working in an uphill battle situation where limited clinical testing hampers the setup of clinical trials and the lack of clinical trials limits the understanding of reliability. But tests in the functional realm that have come before us look at population level statistics or population level responses. And what we're doing is we're looking at single cell level responses. And I'll tell you a little bit about what we're measuring on the next slide here. 
So by utilizing image-based screening, we can mark the cancer cells in the well using antibodies against diagnostic markers. For instance, if a pathologist uses CD34 and CD117 to diagnose acute myeloid leukemia, those are the cell populations that we would be looking at now in our microscope. So we're looking for drugs that are killing off those marker-positive cells, and this would be on target on the left-hand side of this figure here. Drugs that are doing nothing would be inactive, and drugs that are killing off healthy cells or diagnostic marker negative cells would be toxic or that are generally cytotoxic. In this way, we can utilize the healthy cells that are inherent to the patient sample as the internal control for our assay instead of using either just vehicle, DMSO or media, or comparing to healthy human donors. So what we're ultimately measuring is a relative cancer fraction or relative cell fraction which is the percent of live cancer cells over or of the total number of cells under drug treatment over the percentage of live cancer cells of total cells under control. We can then rank what we're testing, and in this case, small molecule drugs, by their efficacy of killing off cancer cells versus healthy cells. On the right-hand side, you'll see that. And we can then say drugs that kill off more cancer cells, leaving the healthy cells alone, have a favorable clinical outcome. And drugs that have a poor clinical outcome probably have uh, either killed all of the cells or were generally cytotoxic to healthy cells. So using the scoring system, we set up a clinical trial. You see the organization and overview here. Um, starting at the left-hand side of the diagram, the patient comes in. This patient uh, had a relapse refractory um, a blood cancer, so it was a basket trial focused around hematological malignancies. Informed consent was collected and the biopsy was taken. Again, the biopsy depends on the clinical manifestation of the cancer. And then we screened the sample through, on average, about 130 approved, clinically approved drugs or clinically obtainable drugs, looking specifically at the drug's ability to kill off cancer cells. This data went into an exalt board. This was exactly like a normal tumor board, except for the fact that they also had another piece of data, which was ours. And then we determined after that if the conclusion criteria of this study were met. And in this case, it was two or more prior treatment lines, so the patient was multi-relapsed, and no further standard treatments available, so they were off guideline therapy. If the inclusion criteria were met, they could enter the pharmacoscopy-guided treatment, and if they were not met, they entered the physician's choice arm. So generally, the treatment of late-stage hematological cancer patients with drugs and combinations predicted to be effective using pharmacoscopy, that was the goal of the study, and each patient's response and PFS is compared to the previous line of the same patient. So we didn't have a randomized cohort here. We used it each patient as their own control model. And you can see here are the interim results uh, of this study. On the left-hand side, you have the best overall response rate from this cohort. And again, we're comparing um, the previous line of therapy to our line of therapy, so one line of therapy longer. So in the left bar here, on the left-hand side of the figure, the left bar, you see the most recent regimen. So you have progressive disease, um, stable disease, and pre-remission for best overall response rate. And on the right-hand bar, you see our pharmacoscopy-guided treatment. You see stable disease, partial response, and complete remission. So even though these patients are one line of therapy farther along in their treatment plan, they're doing better on the overall response than they were previously. Now, on the right-hand side, we have the same cohort. This is progression-free survival. So the Kaplan-Meier doesn't show death in this case. Each drop is an event, so it's a relapse. The dark blue line is the most recent regimen. So you can see the patients were relapsing to their um, against drug treatment. And the light blue line is the pharmacoscopy-guided treatment. So not only did they have a patients with a better overall response rate, but they lasted longer than um, on, they lasted longer to relapse than on their most recent regimen. So patients receiving pharmacoscopy-based treatments have a higher chance of response and have a longer PFS than previous rounds of therapy. I'm going to give two examples here um, of uh, two of the patients in the study. So the top patient was had a diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, multi-relapsed. We looked at the effect of 104 drugs on CD20-positive cells. And you can see the second hit here is abrutinib. Uh, abrutinib have, was the second best in killing off CD20 positive cells versus other cells in the, in the plate. The first was cisplatin. The patient couldn't perceive that because of their age. On the left hand, I'm sorry, on the right hand side of this figure, and, but on the left hand side, you'll see the uh, PET CT. In this uh, dotted square, you'll see the, the cancer here. That was before treatment. 
after the treatment received, after the patient received a brutinib therapy, they entered complete remission. Uh, you can see it on the right-hand side here. On the bottom, uh, you see a patient with BLBL. This patient, uh, again, multi-relapsed, and they had a presenting with a pure effusion. We collected that material for screening and screened them through 266 drugs. And this was actually a library, not just of anti-cancer drugs, but of many drugs. But of the anti-cancer drugs, bortezomib and 6 mecaptopurine were some of the top hits. We prioritized those drugs for this patient, and this patient entered uh, remission. Uh, they did not end up enter entering complete remission, but they were in palliative care and could go home afterwards. So these are just two example responses from late stage patients uh, in the cohort. So we also see that we can predict therapy responses in this mixed basket trial. If we take a look at the four groups of patients that we have, patients that entered um, progressive disease, stable disease, uh, partial response, and complete remission, and we take a look at all of the drugs they were treated with, you'll see that in these two cases, the patients were actually treated with combinations, although we were not screening in combinations. But if we take a look at the um, a uh, partial response here. Uh, the top blue dot is the pharmacoscopy guided treatment. This is an example patient who received pixentron and idealalisib. And when we sum these scores up, um, we can predict that the patient will enter at least some sort of uh, good response profile versus a patient who received, uh, let's say, a negative score from their combination therapy. On the left-hand side in the gray dot, you'll see the patient entered progressive disease. We can predict how well these patients will do, and we can do this on the right-hand side. You'll see at a 92% accuracy, at least between PD versus PR plus CR, and the area under the curve here was a 0 0.84. So it's not just one-off drug treatment, but we can actually look to predict how well these patients will do under the therapy guidelines under the therapy treatments. So a byproduct of this screening is um, fairly large drug response maps, as you see here. And I don't expect you to read or be able to read all of this, although it is published and you can take a look at it. But ultimately, what you end up with is per patient here, a fingerprint of response. We're not the ones, or not even close to the ones, that coined the term fingerprint for drug responses per patient. But I want you to look at the architecture here of the response, because we're not only looking at cell death, we're looking at selective cell death or general cytotoxicity. And we've also layered that on or layered that with the clinical response profiles. And so you can basically use this as almost a map to off-labeling. And to give you an example here, if you can see um, this line or this thread here, this is bortezomib. Bortezomib, blue means uh, the drug did well, it killed off target cells. The red is it had general cytotoxicity and it's overlaid with the therapy responses, green is good. Red is not good. With bortezomib, you see that there's a lot of blue responses here. The drug does fairly well in each patient and does also well clinically. And you can actually see an example of this here. Bortezomib is approved for multiple myeloma. We had one multiple myeloma patient in this study. This is not it. This is a, another diffuse large B-cell lymphoma patient. When we off-label bortezomib for DLBCL, we can see its effectiveness. So it's really a roadmap or a guide to off-labeling therapy that we can produce here. So if we think back at the uh, study overview, you saw that we recruited patients, and then after screening, we determined if they met the inclusion criteria. So another byproduct of that style workflow is that we end up with a lot more data than we actually give, go into the clinic with. The benefit of that is that we can look at big data in the sense of a lot of fingerprinting. So what I want to show you here is just the integrative ex vivo differential drug response. So about 620 patient samples that are then stratified or combined by their response profiles. So again, blue is targeted, red is not targeted, and these uh, this is a basket trial, so these uh, it's a lot of indications here. But I want you to pay attention to something quite interesting. So this is with our architecture. This is with, again, this differential drug response score. But if we take a look just at general cell depth, if we indiscriminately look at the cells and we just see what drugs kill, we actually lose this style architecture. We don't see the same response profiles as we would if we were using this differential drug response score. And this is quite important in defining how drugs are used or how we can off-label drugs in the future. And so we just said we consider this to be fairly large data or fairly big data. But the one thing that's missing here is the identification of a target. And can we use genetics to stratify these patients or these responses farther? So the next thing I want to talk about is the integration of omics data sets, um, in particular a tax seek, and I'll get into that <clears throat> in a second, into pharmacoscopy data to rationally identify drug combinations. 
Um, this is a perspective piece in Nature Medicine that was published in uh, 2017. Um, and I just like the title of it, Functional Precision Cancer Medicine Moving Beyond Pure Genomics. And I like this because what we're trying to do here is not use pure genomics and not use pure functional screening, but a combination of, of both of these in order to better treat patients or better find drugs that work. So just to introduce the story a little bit, we're looking at uh, rational drug combinations, specifically for a brutinib-treated um, chronic lymphoblastic leukemia. So CLL is characterized by a clonal proliferation and accumulation of malignant B lymphocytes, where the interference of the BCR signaling pathway provides therapeutic benefits, such as an inhibitor against BTK, such as a brutinib, which has demonstrated clinical efficacy. Response to a brutinib alone can be slow and incomplete, however, and discontinuation uh, can be associated with rapid disease progression. Further, complete remission from a brutinib is rare or alone is rare, and thus combination treatments are used, and a number of clinical trial programs are working to identify a brutinib combination therapies. And we wanted to, um, again, um, integrate multi-omics data sets to increase the likelihood of actionable data or at least rationally find therapeutics that we could combine with a brutinib clinically. This is an overview of the program. This is uh, papers now in press uh, in Nature Chemical Biology. And so what we did was we collected frozen uh, peripheral blood samples from uh, patients with CLL before they had gone, undergone a brutinib therapy and then three weeks after they had undergone a brutinib therapy. And we performed two things. We performed epigenetic profiling with a taxi, as you can see on, see on top. So we looked for open chromatin states or closed chromatin states. And then we did the chemosensitivity profiling by pharmacoscopy, so single cell extra differential cell screening over uh, about 131 drugs at two concentrations um, in 3D4 well plates. And we looked at the uh, cell death measured by or on target versus off target cell death. And then we integrated these data sets together. So I'll go through some of the top level um, data here for the sake of time. Um, hopefully you can look at the paper soon. I don't know when it's coming online, but hopefully soon. So if we take a look at the ataxic data, what we need to do is we need to look at it from the pathway level. And we use the KEG pathway in order to determine, or let's say in order to find pathways that were being modulated or mediated or changed by a brutinib. So we see that there's increased accessibility here for the proteasome and autophagy pathways, uh, cancer-associated transcriptional deregulation. You can see that on the top part of this graph here. And decreased accessibility for metabolic processes such as stero uh, steroid synthesis or fatty acid degradation and DNA repair. An interesting hypothesis for abrutinib is that the cells that are treated with abrutinib enter a quiescent state. And some of these decreased um, uh, pathways, such as metabolic pathways and DNA repair, uh, possibly foreshadow that or, or speak towards that. And so here we have uh, the pathways that are changed at the genetic level, specifically the chromatin level. And the genetics provided the correlative evidence, but we need to find other tools to have the causative. So you know, what drugs can we use to target these pathways? So here's then the, the drug screening data on the left-hand side Pardon me, you'll see a selection of the 130 drugs. And so we looked at specifically the CD19 and CD5 positive fraction of, of B cells, and these were the CLL cells for these patients. And we wanted to find drugs that, again, had a higher cytotoxicity of the targeted population after brutinib therapy. And things like proteasome inhibitors, such as carfilzomib and bortezomib, the PLK inhibitors, uh, velocitib and BI2536, and mTOR inhibitors, all had higher targeted cytotoxicity of that target population after brutinib therapy. Again, in order to combine data sets, we had to look at what pathways do these drugs affect. And so we looked at the keg pathways um, uh, of the drug effects to, in order to integrate these two data sets together. And we see increased uh, sensitivity in the keg pathways, such as autophagy, proteasome, and not signaling. And you can see some of the major changes here. So then upon integrating these data sets, which you see on this slide here, on one axis, you see changes in chemosensitivity. So on the left, as you go up, um, we see drugs that are more selective to killing off the CLL cells after clinical abrutinib. And on the bottom, or towards the right, you see open pathways that have become open after uh, clinical abrutinib therapy. And thus, in the top right-hand corner, you see pathways that can be targeted uh, both by or that are opening and also can be targeted after abrutinib therapy. And thus, we can utilize this to prioritize drug treatment. So again, proteasome and autophagy being some of the biggest hits, along with the mTOR, uh, mTOR pathways and PLK inhibitors. And then we could follow that up in a synergy screen 
to confirm that while we saw ex vivo as far as uh, brutinib therapy clinically and then testing ex vivo, we could also recapitulate in a com com combination screen. And here you see six examples of that, where we took some of these top hit drugs from the pathway prioritization and then repeated these uh, screenings to find drugs that would increase in their uh, specificity to kill off CLL cells after clinical abrutinib, again, such as bortezomib and perfilzomib. So to summarize this first part, this anti-cancer part, um, pharmacoscopy single cell interrogation can predict in vivo response profiles and thus can be predictive of clinical outcome, at least in this basket trial. Uh, the system for drug to indication matching and drug to patient stratification could potentially enable further off-labeling studies. And there's a need for larger, more systematic single indication studies that follow, really follow EU, US in vitro diagnostic medical device laws and something that we're aiming to do to see what the clinical impact is of these uh, workflows. Uh, lastly, also the, uh, the integration of chromatin accessibility profiling by a tax seek and uh, functional drug testing can systematically identify potential drug combinations. And I want to make a note that we used CLL and imbrutinib as a proof of concept indication to find vulnerable pathways, but the technology and the synergy can be combined for many indications um, and drug combinations in the future. So I want to change uh, gears uh, slightly for the last part of the talk, and this is investigating the mechanisms of immunomodulatory drugs through measuring um, literally the, the cell cell contacts or the physical contacts of cells. Um, I'm a trained immunologist, and something that we always use to look at um, activity or immune activity were ELISAs and cytokine-based readouts, so soluble factors. But some of the biggest events in immunology are the ways that cells communicate physically, such as um, uh, the innate to adaptive immune system and then the propagation of immune responses through uh, the MHC to the, the T cell receptor. And these things aren't usually looked at. But we can infer a lot, especially about immunomodulation from measuring cell cell contacts. And so again, the immune system depends on soluble factors, but also on cell cell contacts um, to function. And cell cell interactions, importantly, are the basis of immunotherapies. Bispecifics bring cells together, and a factor cell kills a target cell. Now, the way that CAR T's work, the CAR T goes in, uh, physically interacts with the cancer cell, and kills it. But there's currently, that we're aware of, no high throughput way to systematically measure these cell cell interactions. When we can utilize is another image based uh, workflow and analysis algorithm to measure cell cell contact changes upon treatment with molecules, biologic small drugs, small molecule drugs to infer immunomodulatory properties. And this is the workflow here. Uh, it's uh, the same as you saw previously, but the math's a little different on the back end. So I want to take a look at an example image here. And this is one fourth of one image of about 7,500, um, so one plate. And I want to draw your attention to uh, two cell types. Uh, the big cells uh, in this image are dendritic cells, and the smaller cells are NK cells. Uh, and anything else that's not stained uh, red or yellow um, are just DAPI positive cells uh, in the background here. And if we take a look at one um, cell and its contacts, so we have one cell in the, in the middle of this image here, and then we have one, two, three, four, five, six contacts around it. And we want to know the distance or the, the physical properties of the, the cell cell contacts between one cell and another cell. But to do that um, st with a statistic statistically sorry, robust matter, we need to actually measure every single cell cell contact that's in this image and then normalize it to what we expect by random. And by doing that, we end up with something that is very robust against cell number changes, against proliferation or cell death, for instance, um, or against plate movement or accidents. This has also been published in Nature Chemical Biology last year. You can take a look at the algorithms that we utilized. But generally speaking, the interaction score, and what I'll discuss, again, the physical interaction or movement of cells, is the number of observed interactions in an image over the number of interactions that are expected by random. And that gives us a robust score of physical contacts of cells. So we can recapitulate a couple of things that are known um, to start about the immune system. Again, I had mentioned earlier that a big process that involves cell cell contacts are APCs, uh, antigen pretending cells, and T cells via MHC2. And what we can do is we can try to add an MHC2 block into the system and see if we can measure properties um, that are changing after the addition of this block. And in fact, this on the right-hand side, you'll see a naive state looking at, this is um, dendritic cells to T cells, so the interaction between DCs and T cells. 
When we add in that MHC2 block in a naive state, we see a reduction of this interaction. If we do it in the background of a VSV infection, so propagation of the immune system, we also see a drop. So the first one in naive is probably scanning. The second is signaling through the MHC. And here, lastly, LPS, we don't see that interaction change with the addition of the MHC2 block, given that probably LPS is not presented on MHC2. So we can not only recapitulate what we expect uh, would happen if we add an MHC2 block in, but we can see it changing depending on the pathway that's activated. We can also recapitulate what is known or the mechanism of action of approved drugs, such as rituximab and lenitumab. Both work by bringing effector cells, whether they be NK cells or T cells, into the physical, um, let's say, connection between B cells, and they kill off that target B cell. On the left-hand side, we look at the interaction between B cells and NK cells. And as we have increasing concentrations of rituximab, which you can see on the black line, we have the increase in interaction score and a decrease of the target cell. So we're killing off that B cell as the interaction cell is going up. That's with rituximab. On the right with lunatumab, we see the same thing. So even though we're killing off the B cell, we're still seeing that increase of interaction score. So again, it's robust to changes in cell number. So these were small examples. We can actually use this in fairly large throughput and screening. This is 1,400 drugs that we had done. Uh, this is collapsed onto its Keg and Kemble annotations. And we're looking here at B cells, T cells, macrophages, and DCs and their interaction profiles in the background of a virus infection that we use to just start the stimulation. Blue are cells that are coming together, uh, red are cells that are coming apart. And then we can see how drugs in this system um, uh, possibly affect these interactions or these scores. What we found, this library was made up of about 50% FDA approved drugs and 50% small molecule or tool compounds. And we found was about 12% of the drugs we used, and, and in fact, about 10% of all FDA approved drugs in this, in this uh, screen had some sort of immunomodulatory phenotype, which was quite cool. Uh, just to give you one example, uh, if we take a look at um, statins, or, um, uh, acetyl-CoA reductase inhibitors, they decrease the interaction between dendritic cells and T cells. And in 2001, there was a paper published, statins selectively inhibit leukocyte function antigen 1 by binding to a novel regulatory integrin site. So we're recapitulating also what is known about certain drugs and their effect on, on various cell types. But we wanted to find something that was unknown to see if we could actually work out a pathway of a drug that had a, a potential immunomodulatory effect that may be in the background of its normal mechanisms of action. So if we looked at the, the family on the top uh, left-hand side, if we looked at the family of receptor protein tyrosine kinase inhibitors, in which we had four here, we can see that there's an increase selectively of CD11C positive cells, probably dendritic cells, and CD3 positive cells, probably T cells, and there was an increase in that relationship. And it turns out that two of these um, uh, protein tyrosine kinase inhibitors, uh, crizotinib, uh, both R and S enantiomers, were causing an increase of this physical interaction profile. We published um, the pathway or the mechanism that we had found to do this. I'll just give you a brief overview. So on, uh, on the right-hand side, you'll see a facts plot. Uh, here you have uh, dendritic cells or CD11C positive cells and also MHC2. And we found that crizotinib was increasing the expression of MHC2 on dendritic cells and, in fact, was doing the same with MHC2 and MHC1 on APCs in general and also cancer cells. And here we have the model here. We believe that crizotinib and also a like molecule BSM, now BMS777601 was blocking the effects of uh, the receptor MST1R, causing an increase of downstream MHC uh, progression. I skipped over the model only because it's published and for time, um, and you can take a look at that. But it's quite interesting to know that TKI, which is approved for lung cancer, uh, possibly has some sort of immunomodulatory effect in the background here. So the summary of the second part of my, my talk, the quantification of cellular proximity can be a surrogate readout for effect on immune function. Immunomodulatory screening can be a new dimension into screening campaigns or can be used to uncover de novo drugs. And antibodies by specific CAR Ts all induce cell cell contacts. And we don't currently, or it is not common to look at the cell cell contacts of immune function uh, as, a, as a readout of how well these items are, or these um, potential therapeutics are, are working. My take home message um, from this webinar and from this talk, pharmacoscopy technology can be used for many things, including precision and translational medicine. And we look forward to, let's say, closing out uh, the clinical trial, uh, which is, is still recruiting, but coming uh, to a close now. 
uh, de novo drug discovery and drug repurposing, and molecular systems biology. And regarding precision medicine and precision technologies or uh, precision diagnostics, my assumption is the combination of many of these technologies, both pan-functional, so different types of functional drug screening, and pan-genetics, so different types of genetics, will likely be needed to meet the challenges of um, predicting clinical response. So with that, I just want to reiterate that these projects were performed when I was a, a postdoc at uh, SEM, the Center for Molecular Medicine, the Austrian Academy of Sciences, and the laboratory of Julius Lucretti Ferga, in collaboration with the Department of Hematology at the Medical University of Vienna, uh, with, with Professor Uli Jaeger. Uh, this work was done in also collaboration with Baron Schneider, who co-invented this workflow with me, who's now at the professor of the, who's now a professor of uh, ETH, now a professor at the ETH Zurich, pardon me along with Nicholas Kral, um, who is now the CEO of Allsight, uh, along with everyone else from SEM who either helped in the first two projects, um, either on the functional screening site or in the genetics. Um, and also on the right-hand side, you'll see a number of physicians who not only entrusted us with their patient samples also, um, but who also entrusted us to help them treat their patients through this clinical trial from SEM, um, and also their feedback on not only is technology like this necessary for the clinic, but as key opinion leaders, what could really help them? And we are very enthusiastic to, to continue our relationship, both from SEM and the Medical University with, with Allside. So with that, I thank you everyone for tuning in, uh, and I look forward to taking um, any questions I can. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Vladimir, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the answer question box located on the far left of your screen, and we'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. So let's get started. Our first question is, both programs, the differential cell death and uh, immunomodulation seem like very data heavy processes, both from raw image collection and then downstream image analysis point of view. Can you comment on the pipelines or systems that you use for this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, it, it's a funny story. So Allsight is a startup company and we aim to collect data quickly and we aim to process data quickly. And to do this um, robustly, you need a fairly large computational network um, and professionally maintained cluster that we just do not have. So we teamed up or we utilize a Google Cloud Platform in order to um, process this data very quickly. And you can see a really nice overview on our website of um, how we use uh, the Google workflow and uh, how we put our uh, analysis software into a Google Cloud that really gives us unlimited uh, power on bringing up uh, virtual machines and bringing up um, nodes in order to analyze our data and do our research quickly so we can get this data either back into our customers' hands or patient hands. And our next question, it seems that you are mostly geared towards blood malignancies. Do you have programs in solid tumors or other diseases? So right now we're really focused on blood malignancies. We have um, one program that's looking at uh, pure effusion and ascites uh, as um, secondary indications uh, for or secondary malignancies for solid tumor indications. So such as, can we predict a drug response in pure effusion that comes from a late stage lung cancer patient, and can we predict response of that lung cancer patient? The same for ovarian and other GI tract cancers. Um, at the moment, I can't really comment on it. Regarding other indications or other diseases, um, such as rheumatoid arthritis uh, or other uh, sterile inflammation, yes, um, but not as, um, let's say, strong in uh, progression as our uh, blood, mal blood, blood malignancy program. Now, Dr. Vladimir, do you, do you do any specific disease screening for immuno-oncology, any sterile inflammatory, uh, inflammatory disease, for instance? Yeah, so that's what I was just referring to. I, um, we don't have any uh, current programs that are looking at inflammatory diseases, although, you know, any type of sterile inflammation will have a huge uh, a backbone, backbone of, of propagation that relies on cell cell contacts. And so if we can utilize our workflows and look for cell cell contacts we could potentially target, we could create new immunotherapies or new cell-based assays that could interrupt these cell cell contacts, thus reducing 
um, let's say, the burden or the inflammatory burden on, on the patient. So it's something we, we would really like to get into. Possible, we'll see. Thank you, Dr. Vladimir. Do you have any final comments for our audience? Um, just that uh, we really like collaborations. Uh, we benefit both on learning about our own technology, but also helping um, clinical need uh, drug discovery programs, both on uh, cell, um, let's say cell death or immunomodulatory function. So if anyone has an interest, uh, please don't hesitate to, to reach out. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Uh, any questions we did not have time for today will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information that you provided at the time of registration. We would like to thank Labroots and our sponsor, Perkin Elmer, for underwriting today's educational webcast. The test can be viewed on demand through June of 2019. Labroots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.